Welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today's show, we have Michael Kane, co-founder of Hydrogen Platform. Hydrogen Platform is a platform as a service company that enables companies to build their own financial services offerings without having to become a financial institution by piggybacking off a no-code platform. And with that, here's my interview with Michael. Hello, Mike. Hi. Nice. Thanks for taking the time. Yes, likewise. Hope you're staying safe and healthy. Uh, so far, so good. So Mike Kane, co-founder of Hydrogen Platform. Tell us about Hydrogen. Hydrogen is embedded finance simplified. What that means really simply is let's imagine you're a financial services professional or fintech company and you want to go add a PFM component or a cards component or banking component to your app or your website. What we do is we take that time to market and cost down over 80% by allowing you to use no code and low code components to very easily plug in uh, these different configurations and components and libraries without doing any of the development work. Okay. We probably lost a bunch of people there, but we're going to circle back and explain all that. So don't, don't give up. I got to tell you, this is one of the more interesting ones I think I'm going to have in the next little while. So tell us about the history of hydrogen. Where did the idea come from? Like, why, where, What did you do before this and how did this come to be? Uh, history of hydrogen is it's interesting. Uh, myself, my twin brother, Matt, run the company. We started another fintech company in 2009. And that was a investment app. Uh, similar audiences familiar with Robinhood or Acorns or Wealthsimple in Canada. Mm -hmm. It was a mm -hmm. digital app. Yeah. We built that from scratch from 2009, 2014. And at that time, the iPhone just started. So there was no distribution for fintech apps. There really was no APIs. So Stripe was just starting. There was no way of opening digital bank accounts, digital brokerage accounts, doing KYC. So all of the infrastructure everyone takes for granted now didn't exist. So we had to build all of that from scratch. We had to figure out how to move money, how to open accounts, et cetera, et cetera. So that took us many, many, many years uh, to build. Uh, long story short, we were able to scale that business up, raise VC funding, but we saw that you know, there's actually a very small window for building a consumer company. And why have a regulated consumer company that only can exist in one vertical in the US when we had at that time, five years ago, hundreds of firms asking us for our technology. So we said, well, why can't we just take our expertise, put that into a platform and then allow all of these companies to use the technology that we had built in a more B2B enterprise application layer. Uh, so that's really the impetus for Hydrogen was we decided to throw everything away we were doing at the last company and start a new venture because we think this is a multi-billion dollar opportunity and it's been proven. Now, if you look at Marketa and Stripe and Rails Bank and Rapid and all these other fintech companies, audience may or may not have read about, uh, it's a similar kind of industry. And what we're doing is just trying to package it up and, and offer it for a more mass consumable audience. So our audience doesn't need to be a developer. That they don't need to be sophisticated to now use these tools because we've packaged them in a way that's very easy to use. Excellent. So we'll come back to all that in a second. I have a very burning question for you. How hard does your staff find it to tell you two you apart? <laughs> when both your bosses are twins, I feel like that would lead to trouble. <laughs> well, not too bad. So I run all of our business team and that's sales, yeah. marketing, et cetera. And Matt, my brother, runs all the tech and product. So there's really not a lot of overlap. We're very infrequently on the same call or talking to the same yeah. people. So uh, it's actually not, not too bad. I also wear glasses. So, Matt, there you go. A few years ago. So you could usually tell us apart that way now. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go there. All right. So, but let's just sum this up simply as what you do is you have made the difficult parts of creating integrate uh, of financial technology integration easy. And you've layered a application of no code to low code over top of it. And I'm going to dig into both of those in a sec. So for those who are unfamiliar with, say, the stripes of the world and how, why they're so popular, like you don't have to build your own payment infrastructure. You literally copy and paste a couple of lines of code into your site and ta-da, you can accept payments and it's safe and everything else, right? So that sort of elimination of massive amounts of friction has made them a huge company and rightly so. What you're doing is expanding well beyond just that simple one function. Tell us about all the different services that someone can basically, I want to, I'm a, I want to start a FinTech that does X, Y, Z. I mean, you mentioned a couple of them. So what specific solutions can I turn to you to be able to say, hey, I want to build this, but I don't want to build all the rails it works on. What can, you know, what can you do for me? Yes, it's a very good point. So you exactly correct. You think of Stripe, they were very disruptive and with, in the industry, we call this orchestration, but it's really, in simple terms, packaging up 
of different solutions. So mm -hmm. 20 years ago, if you wanted to, to offer credit card payments, you would need to integrate five or six or seven or eight or 10 pieces. You need to what's called orchestrate them together and build a data infrastructure and host it and do business contracts and legal. Stripe and other firms have done and why they're worth so much money is they package all that together and they offer it to you very simply. And now that's one line of code. So you don't need to be very technical to do that because they've done all the underlying work. We're able to do that across other verticals. So not just credit card payments, but let's say you wanted to offer what we call money. Money to us would be a personal finance solutions like budgeting, cash flow analysis, account aggregation, uh, PFM tools or small business tools. Uh, so let's say you're a lender and you want to do a small business loan. Instead of having the user type in their cash flows or estimate how much the money they have in their account or expenses from the last three months, which I've had to do as a small business owner, applying for yeah. loans, yes, it's very painful. What if you could automatically pull that in without doing any integration work and I'll be able to offer UI that you can configure with your logo, with your colors, so the end user doesn't know that they're using hydrogen. And we've done all of the configuration and integration for you. So we offer that now across different verticals, money, also cards that will be offering debit cards, for example, one of the mm -hmm. fast growing parts of FinTech. Uh, and that's a big part of buy now, pay later. If you're anyone's familiar with firm, being able to offer like instant payment options to buy. Right now I'm in the market for an yep. iPhone. So you could give people an instant uh, Visa or MasterCard where they could uh, purchase something. Uh, or if you wanted to do a branded card, if you're starting a challenger bank, or even if you're a accountant and you just want to have payment cards for rewards for your users, imagine millions of those customers being able to offer us. Uh, so that we offer in cards. And we're also launching a, a payments structure that would allow anyone to do ACHs or wires or EFTs in Canada and uh, banking that would be checking and savings. And next year we plan to launch insurance, crypto and lending. So the end goal would be have all of the different uh, FinTech verticals covered where you could be a small business. You don't need to have a product team. You don't need to have engineers. You could plug in it to your website. You don't even need to have a, an app as long as you have HTML access on your website, which most companies have something, you should be able to plug in these components. So we, we think it's very disruptive. I would agree with you. So essentially, I mean, talk about turning your platform as a service for all of fintech backend. I mean, you're you're dealing with Matt, you're dealing with uh, everything from data aggregation and dealing with all that data to secure transactions to um, to jeez, oh, I mean, on and to I think a lot of it even like facilitating the transaction or the tracking, right? So I mean, I'm looking at some of the stuff you have on your website around Robo. You know, I'm sure you it looks like you, you guys do some KYC AML stuff for you tie in the systems to do that. Yes, that's correct. Oh, I did miss that by the way. Are we oh, all, you missed that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Advice, uh, brokerage will be offering uh, trading, fractional share trading uh, to your application. So let's say you're launching a budgeting app uh, or a savings app and you want to have part of the savings go to spending on a Visa card. You want part yeah. of the savings to go towards a goal or retirement. You want part of it to go towards uh, some proprietary trading account. So our platform will allow you to, to do all three of those pieces without doing any development or integration work. So you just plug yeah, it. So I want to start the FinTech Impact Robo Advisor, right? I could literally build the entire flow where I would basically have a client would download the app. They would then basically, um, you know, verify that who they are through KYC AML. They could link to their existing brokerage account to pull the data from that. That would then populate the forms that would then, you know, open the accounts that would then sell them would then be tracking everything, including if they're spending, if I want to do PFM. So the entire value chain of the heavy lifting has all been modularized and it's all been basically standardized so that I can just pick it up off a shelf and plug it into an input, essentially. Correct. And it's yeah. all together. One of the things that many firms don't realize until they start trying to build these solutions is that you can't necessarily go to one vendor to do some of these things. So you mentioned KYC. A, a vendor that does payments or cards or banking may not offer KYC. They say, well, that's not our responsibility. You have to do your own KYC. Yeah. We don't verify the bank account when you move the money in. They only typically do their silo. And that's a big problem that exists now in FinTech. It's similar to healthcare, logistics. You have to put together a lot of pieces. So that's also what we do is we put these together. When we say we orchestrate them, we, we package them up. So our users don't see any of that. And they don't have to know what they need to package. 
uh, which is important. Well, essentially action. you're trying to make it turnkey, right? Like you're basically saying, you, you've done all the heavy lifting for me, right? Like it's remarkable. So, I mean, clearly, you know, when we talk about the concept of open banking, this is, this is the future we're talking about here is the ability to, I mean, you're not, you know, open banking doesn't fully exist yet, right? You don't have quite the easy payment rails that you would otherwise. I mean, I'm sure there was an enormous amount of heavy lifting to create all of these integrations and all these plays, but a true open banking platform would, made it, would have made that a lot easier, correct? Yes. And there's geographical constraints here to doing mm-hmm. the packaging. We, we offer two parts for our platform. We have the fully packaged, what we call no codes, which is the solutions put together and modularized, as you mentioned. Uh, mm-hmm. That exists mostly in the US, also in Canada, in some pieces, or the UK, uh, potentially in Europe. As you get into other geographies, let's say in Costa Rica, we'll get a request and say, I want to offer cards in Costa Rica. We say, sure, you could do that. But we offer outside of the note codes, we have a developer center. Uh, you would have to put that together in Costa Rica to be able to do that. You have to go into our APIs and our back end and do the same work that we've done. Because in many of these markets, the yeah. banking or the rails don't exist. Not yeah. much do about that. But you know, we're built for the long haul. We're assuming within 10 years that most of these markets will, will get there and we should be able yeah. to offer the package solutions globally. Well, it's only going to make it easier for you to make those integrations stronger once it actually happens. And, you know, for people who want to contrast, like, just how different this is from what existed before, go back and listen to my interview with Daniel from Coho, Canadian Neobank or Challenger Bank, who, when they started up, none of this existed. They had to build it off from scratch. And he talks at length about how that was a, a real big lift. Now, if I wanted to start a Challenger Bank in Canada, technically, I could just utilize your platform and be up and running within a fraction of the time, right? Because I mean, and what people don't realize is that a lot of this stuff that happens with open banking and all this other stuff is that it relies on someone else's infrastructure. I'm not actually getting a banking license. The bank I'm dealing with is getting a banking license. I'm a layer that sits over top of them. So we've talked about the platform pieces and components. I'm going to go to no code and low code. And this has been coming up a little bit more frequently in my conversations. And explain the concept to me, to everybody. I'll, I'll, ju- I'll jump in and add to it. Sure. So if you just think about it logically, you'll have high code, which is how Facebook and Google and Netflix or whatever other platform is made. You sit there one night in your dorm room like Facebook and you code a platform from scratch at the protocol level. That's pretty straightforward. Um, That's traditionally how FinTech worked was was very high code. And and traditionally that is done through in in financial services, a, a consulting firm some kind of systems integrator. And that's why Accenture and Deloitte make so much money from banks. Mm-hmm. Insurance companies, they say, what do you want to build? We're going to build it for you. So that's a high code. A low code is what really sprung up in the last 10 years. If you look at what's considered middleware or FinTech APIs, these are things like Plaid and Stripe to some extent, but uh, Marketa now has become very large in the card issuance. Those are more low code and that they've built a layer on top of those high code systems, and high codes are from the banks and the back offices, they built a layer on top where they've done a lot of the work for you, but you still need to have technical expertise. You need to work with them and, and you need to do some coding because they haven't put it all together. And no code is one layer above that. No code, the concept there is all of the software and the packaging and the UI is done for you. So instead of going into the bottom layer and building that middle layer and the top layer, or going into the middle layer and building the top layer, which is basically the UI. That's what the end user would see. The UI is the most difficult part. It's the most difficult thing to make is the no code because you need the two layers below that. Yeah, to build a foundation for it first. Yeah, I mean, for anyone who's ever tried to build a website on Squarespace or Wix, this is exactly what we're talking about, right? Whereas, you know, they've turned things that used to be hundreds of lines of code into a drag and drop element. I can just move from one thing to another, right? Um, it's the same thing as like moving, you know, moving a calendar appointment on Google Calendar. That is technically no code programming in some in way, some way to speak, right? Like I am moving, I am changing something, or I'm adding an element, and nothing is basically being. I'm not having to, you know, open up a text line and uh, a command line and type stuff in. For those of you interested in learning about this, I, I took a eight week bubble um, a boot camp at a company called Bubble.io. It's a platform for building your own applications in a no-code environment. And I mean, I honestly, this is the most exciting part of technology to me right now is the concept of no-code. The ability to empower countless people to have an idea and without spending a ton of money on development, go and actually just maybe take a couple of classes online that are typically free 
and build the test model of your product, right? And prove whether or not it works. And it is, I, I think we're at the cusp of a massive boom in innovation because the number of people, as people discover this, the number of people who are actually trying to fix problems is going to increase substantially. So very important, very excited to see these things coming. And it's interesting because I've talked to several plays recently where this is becoming a real major trend. So to me, it's super exciting. Yes, no, I agree. And if you just look at it from a business standpoint, anyone who's looking to build a software platform is projected over $30 billion of revenue just in SaaS and software for no code in the next five to 10 years because all these older platforms now need to transition because now you're competing with Squarespace and Canva for those who use that. Yeah. A bubble is a really good platform, as you mentioned uh, as well. You're actually manipulating code underneath it. You just don't realize you're doing yeah. it. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, and every then, box is like a couple hundred lines of code. Like you add something that, oh, I want to put in a search box here. You drag and drop it. It's a search box. But, you know, underneath that, hundreds of lines of code. And an interesting thing is that even, even companies that are, have large scale consumer products are using these things, these platforms. And the speed at which some of the development I'm seeing get done now is just neck breaking compared to what it used to be. Yes, it's much faster time to market. And I think the, the reason why this hasn't been too popular yet in FinTech or other verticals where there's mm -hmm. a lot of data, because it's very complicated. It's a bit different than doing a website because a website, yeah. HTML, PHP, Java code. Here we have that, plus we have all of the data infrastructure. So you're opening accounts, you're doing web hooks, which is basically, let's say you have a, a checking account. We need to track every day the transactions. We need to yep. clean the data. We need to send alerts to customers through, through our platform. So it's, it's leaps and bounds more complicated from a no-code perspective because of that. Um, so we're basically taking the foundation that Squarespace, and Wix, and Canva have made and adding the fintech elements to it, which is all the data infrastructure. And that's where most companies struggle the most. You don't know that you need that until you start building these platforms. And then you get halfway in and you say, oh, wow, we have to build a, a data analytics team and an infrastructure team. And it becomes very, very costly at that point. So we're trying to alleviate much of that cost. No doubt. And you're doing it. I mean, that's, uh, it's just, I, can't, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough how exciting a time this is uh, to want to build stuff because honestly, it's just, it's so much easier. So let's talk about kind of like the end vision for this. And uh, this is a concept that's really been kind of exciting me as well is, you know, we talked previously, theoretically, anyone who wants to start at, like basically offering some sort of financial service around their existing brand now has the ability to do so very easily. And we're seeing like major tech players, like the likes of Apple with Apple Card and other things get into this space, right? They're utilizing and leveraging their trust and their attention with consumers to basically um, to start offering financial services. How do you see this playing out with other brands and other companies and specifically leveraging your platforms and, and those like it? It's a really good point. There's a famous VC called Andreessen Horowitz. There's mm -hmm. been other VCs and consulting firms that have put out reports recently. They've coin this market embedded finance, meaning that you know, they believe and we believe that you should be able to embed or integrate or deploy financial services quickly. 10 years ago, that would mean you're a financial services company or a fintech company. What we believe in the future is that every company will have fintech components. You'll need to offer these. If you look at, for example, you know, Netflix and other, you mentioned Apple, you're embedding consumer experiences and, and financial services experience inside of the app. User doesn't even know that. Like right now I'm in front of my Roku TV. I could press a button and buy a subscription. You know, that hits some third party API to, to do the payment, to do the subscription. I could cancel that. It's then hooked into my iPhone and you could do subscription analysis. There's apps now that just allow you to manage those subscriptions. So everything is so tied together now. And in the end, consumer doesn't even see that every minute of the day, they're actually interacting with some financial services API or component. So that's really what we envision as a connected world where every company on earth, whether you know it or not, is using a platform like ours and embedding and integrating these different financial components. So we believe that's the future. It's, it's not siloed platforms and siloed experiences, yep. integrated uh, commingled experiences where all these different things are coming together. And you're starting to see that a bit more. Uh, we're actually very excited about you know, AR, VR, and some other technologies in the next you know, 20 years because we could fully immerse with society in this. Uh, and also to us, you know, this is a global 
problem, but also a challenge. And there's a lot of potential there. You know, right now, most companies like ours can only target most of the developed markets. But mm-hmm. within the next 10 to 20 years, we theorize that Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, they'll have the infrastructure, the 5G now, they'll have the speed and the bandwidth and Wi-Fi will be virtually free within 10 years globally that you should be able to use these components and the massive, massive opportunity. I agree with you. I mean, it's um, it's very much on trend. I mean, we've been talking about, uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, the, uh, the paper on the, the Copernican revolution in banking and, and talking about moving everything towards you know, traditional banks will eventually just become platform providers for people who set their specific niches on top of that. And you're right on that. You're providing that middle layer that basically enables that to be possible. When you start thinking about the number of use cases and how many people could enhance the relationship with the consumer through financial services arrangements, simple example that comes to mind for me right now is the airlines, right? How many airlines are getting criticized around the world for not refunding tickets right now because if they refund all their tickets, they'll probably go broke. But, you know, if they actually, had, you know, let's imagine they had their own challenger bank attached to to that, right? Theoretically, would you, would you be as, as, as annoyed if that money you couldn't redeem was also earning interest or incentives, right? Like that is something that would be possible under a framework like, like that. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be a COVID crisis. Like I cancel something, I'm entitled to refund or credit. Well, it would be nice if that credit worked for me. You know, a lot of companies already do that sort of stuff with like, we get rewards for spending like Starbucks stars, right? But you know what? There's entire business models built off cash sweeps. I mean, the custodians in in the US that offer no trading cost uh, platforms, right? They make a ton of money, like Schwab. Most of their money comes from making it from the cash sweep, right? There's no reason why other institutions can't basically start offering the same similar services and and making us a little less annoyed with them, (laughs) quite honestly, when they hold on to our money. Yes, and just imagine that Starbucks example, if they had access to all of your other spending. So what if they were able to pull in all of your other spending from all your other apps? So that's really what we're talking about with embedded finance is everything is integrated yep. together. Everyone can see and get data and analytics. They could push rewards. They know that you spent money on one of their competitors yesterday and they'll say, hey, come here, we'll give yep. you a off. They don't know that right now. Uh, so yeah, assuming that you assuming you opt in, let's be careful. Let's be careful about that because that's exactly what we want to do. We want to make sure we opt in because that is a you know that does creep some people out. <laughs> but um, I will say this much: like you know, this is I've contemplated you know writing about this, and I probably will at some point. But the way I look at it is there's the mass fragmentation that may happen in the financial services world because of the Copernican Revolution and platforms like yours, where everybody starts offering some form of financial service uh, piece on that, right? There's maybe interoperability or inter- intercommunication of, of transactions amongst parties based on your consent to that. But at the same time, I also look at with all this fragmenting, there's got to be no one wants to keep track of where 20 different accounts are. Right. I already see that sometimes with people and it, it just drives us nuts. It's, you know, the, the piece for the aggregation piece is going to sit in the middle. Right. I almost figure like we're going to see intelligent agents, AI bots that sit in there and know your, your spending habits that basically then push your money that would traditionally be held at a bank to the institutions, char- challenger bank that rewards you the best to support your lifestyle. If I go to Starbucks on a daily basis, just to continue to pick on them, maybe more of my bank account money should be held at the Starbucks bank because I'm getting rewarded with incentives that help reduce my overall expenditure, right? Uh, If I fly with a certain airline over and over again, same thing, like looking at my actual spending patterns as to not only incentivize me to utilize them, but also direct me to the ones who are going to basically benefit my lifestyle the most. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And what this new open banking and API embedded finance infrastructure allows you to do is all of these brands can essentially create their own banks. They can create their own payment yep. platforms, their own banks, their own cards, their own investment firms, if they are, get the regulatory approval to do so, uh, because the, all these sit on top of legacy infrastructure. So it, it, you don't have to build all of that. And that's really the big disruption here is uh, the biggest thing that's happened, I think, in FinTech is actually the financial institutions have woken up and they said, well, instead of trying to compete with Apple and Google and others, why don't we partner with them? For example, Goldman Sachs, you never- <laughs> That's you happened know. in your country, okay? <laughs> <That's all I'm laughs> say. Yeah. Ain't happening in my country, <laughs> <I'm> continue. <laughs> That's right. you know, you know, Goldman Sachs, if you would have told me 10 years ago, they would partner with Apple to yep. offer the Apple car. I would say, no, absolutely. Why would they do that? They would just offer their own car, but it comes, it, this all comes from consumer demand. When the consumers yeah. demand more price competition, they demand better products, you get these kind of tie-ups. And that's a lot of trends. If you read a lot of 
consulting reports. There's much more collaboration between national services companies and traditional tech. Now we expect that to continue and also accelerate in the future. Well, I mean, the most valuable resource, uh, I mean, data is the new oil. Let's, let's just get over that, right? Like this is the new oil for sure. But I also say like the most valuable resource online is attention, right? Like if Apple's got my attention staring at their device for X number of hours per day, like it totally makes sense that if I'm Goldman Sachs, I'm like, here, let me be your backer. Because for me to try to aggregate that amount of attention in order to convert X percentage of people and get to that level of scale, who else is going to bring that to the table, right? Like that's, that's the reality of it, right? You can, you know, the ad spend that they saved because of that is, it, is, is you know, almost incalculable in my mind. Like I can't imagine, I don't know how many Apple card users there are currently, but if you imagine uh, Goldman starting from zero and getting to that point in the same amount of speed, the, the ad spent would just be, would just be absurd. It would be yes. impossible. Yes. But I, I think it also might go in reverse. Not many people have talked about this, but I could imagine financial services companies launching electronic products at some point. <laughs> I know most people don't think this way, but if there's such large market share with Google and Samsung yeah. and Apple in the future, I don't see why banks, they have enough money and they have enough cash. They could create phones and AR headsets it wouldn't surprise me if they start getting into that market. So that's I, I think the true challenge there is culture. I think I think the the ability for to teach that elephant to dance differently is is very difficult. And may, maybe a newer innovative bank comes along that does that. I think it's possible. I don't think it's that's that probable. Yeah, not so yeah, it is possible. And I think a lot of this is just thinking ahead. And that's a lot of what we try to do in our partnerships is just try to think what are the trends going to be? Let's try to get ahead of them. And a lot of what we're pitching is very new. So we, we have to really pitch this longer term, long tail vision to a lot of our partners. And a lot of them like it because it's very different than where they've been in the past. And they view it as a way to be competitive going forward. Well, I think um, it's, to me, this is by far where the puck is going. Like it's, you know, it may be, it may be a little bit far out, but being Canadian, using hockey analogies and Gretzky's in particular oh, too much, um, this is the, definitively where the puck is going. I mean, the it, we're, all we're doing is making things frictionless and deepening relationships with consumers. Of course, people are going to want that, right? Like that is that's going to make a lot of sense. And you know, when you think about market share of banks to date, they're always competing with each other. That's fine, but in theory, they could just be. As I've said before, if they get smart, they just be the backbone and let everybody else compete for market size. And they don't care who wins because at the end of the day, they're they're still providing that service regardless of the winner is. So it is um, it is exciting times in the future if this all comes to fruition. So before we wrap up, there's three questions I ask everybody uh, to make you think. The first one is, if you had one wish for something you can change in your firm or the industry as a whole, what would it be? I think in terms of the industry, definitely pricing costs. Uh, many of these solutions are too costly. Uh, a lot of the oh. infrastructure costs too much for the end user. If you look, for example, interchange fees, it's a good example. You know, why are merchants, let's say a small business, why are you charged 3% Every trend, every time someone swipes, and now everyone's yeah. moving 100% towards electronic payments, and it's, it's very unfair. So that's something we would like to change. I think going forward is make pricing more competitive for small business. I largely understand that concern because it's uh, it's a commonly echoed one, and it's, it's I think there's a lot of power to entrenched revenue sources, and a lot of especially with the short-term nature of Wall Street, looking at your top line and your bottom line simultaneously even if your bottom line increases, but your top line basically decreased, they see that as negative, right? And I think that's just a bizarre way to look at the universe, given the mass efficiencies we're starting to see from technology. I have to think that sooner or later, some CEO gets bold enough as to say like, guess what? This number is not really what matters at the top. What numbers is the number at the bottom. And if you want to punish me because I'm down 10% there, but I'm up 50% here, go ahead, right? Like someone, someone's going to be bold enough one day to do that. But, um, and that, that, that may set the stage for other people starting to think properly about this, but I, I've seen it. I've spoken to to people <laughs> who are who are you know who basically said the same thing. Well, you know, I basically if I do that, yeah, I know I'll make more money, but if I give up that revenue, then I'm going to get crucified for it, right? Like measuring the wrong. It's it's and I'll tell a story quickly. The uh, Jack Welsh in his book specifically talked about you know basically being careful what you measure because. It was this famous story about how they, you know, give a mandate to increase sales by X percent, right? So sure enough, the, say the guys come back and sales have increased by X percent. Well, that's fantastic. But your bottom line dropped by this amount. He's like, well, you didn't tell me to do that, right? Like, I actually have to say, you know, he said, well, I you know, had them do the top and the bottom. And in the old world, I think that makes sense. I think in the future, the only number is the bottom and, and the top will get driven to where it has to be for the bottom to happen. Anyway, I agree with that. 
Excellent. So second question for you, what's been the biggest challenge in getting the company to where it is today? I think the challenge for any tech company, whether you're in FinTech or anything else, it's just getting enough capital to get the product mm -hmm. to market and be successful. Number one challenge of any entrepreneur is get, you know, convincing customers, being lean. You know, we've been yep. profitable the, last, the first few years of running the company and you know, convincing then investors and stakeholders to take a chance on you. So that's always a challenge. It's really not specific. Mm -hmm. I think it's especially no, no. in tech because Fintech is still a bit of a traditional industry where people look for resumes and what you've done in the past. It's starting to change a bit. And it's also something we would like to change in the industry. I also think a lot of the attitudes come down to, okay, uh, if you're Fintech, like show me how many bodies you're going to eliminate. Like, I feel like that is part of the entire thing that every VC is looking for. It's like, oh, you're going to destroy advisors. Great. You're going to destroy back office. That's great. Like that, they're like, show me the efficiency you're going to squeeze out of the system as opposed to show me the future. Right. Or, or basically how are you going to, how do you get to basically enable the next generation of product? Like I'm, I think everybody's just focused in the wrong place. And you know, the, the classic example I brought up countless times that I'm sure the VCs loved them when they pitched it, it was like Wealthfront. We're going to put advisors out of business. Yeah. That hasn't worked out so well. You didn't understand the problem quite well. Right. I like that one, but it's famous that Robinhood was turned down by at least 50, 75, maybe more VCs when they yeah. started like a $10 million valuation probably. And now they're worth, billion or more. I don't know what their yep. valuation is. And they're pitching a new business model. In the yeah. And we're at countless hours of amusement and looking at the data and stories that come out of it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that, it's similar to what we're doing in, in that we're pitching a new way of looking at things and yep. new way of presenting a platform, a new way of pricing as well. So that, I think it's a challenge when you're doing something new, getting yep. people aligned with what you're doing. But so far we've been successful. Well, it's, you know, it's the zero to one paradigm as, uh, as Peter Thiel talks about and creating something new is a heck of a lot harder to sell than going from one to two, right? Too much of the money's chasing one to two, not zero to one. Anyway, last question for you is what excites you the most about what it is you're working on and keeps you up getting up every morning to fight the good fight? I think it's just the potential if you look long-term and being able to target underserved markets, uh, not just in the U.S., which is definitely with small businesses. Like I mentioned, you know, they get screwed right now in terms of mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of software they could use. It's very high cost. Uh, many companies can't use a lot of the products that we offer right now because they don't have a million dollars to develop things. But that's in the US. Imagine if you're in, I don't know, Belize or in uh, Zimbabwe or wh wherever the country is, Indonesia, and you want to offer these things. Imagine being able to launch this. It's impossible, totally impossible. It doesn't even matter if you have $5 million. That's yeah. Many people don't in those markets. So I think that's actually the most exciting to us is the ability long term to have change globally on how people consume financial services. And we're not there yet. Uh, we are there pretty soon in the US and in North America. But you know, being able to do that in a lot of other markets is really interesting to us as well because uh, they just don't have access to a lot of these products and you have monopolies and oligopoly mm -hmm. and financial services and a lot of these. Oh, things. I know about that. <laughs> <laughs> and it does well a little bit, but at least there's infrastructure and we can plug into the infrastructure there. And there's still a fintech ecosystem. In yeah. I mean, We're not to... that bad. We're just bad. Anyway, I'll stop harping. <laughs> Continue. Not too bad. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and when you're talking about developing markets in particular and the challenges of it, it's, um, I don't know if you read the last book Clayton Christensen wrote, I can't even remember the name now, but specifically one of the things he talked about was looking for quote unquote non-consumption as a sign of, of delayed consumption and talks about like, you know, when they talked about rolling out, there was no, there was no cell phones or there was no phones period in a lot of developing countries, right? Like, you know, there was good, good luck getting a phone line somewhere, especially into like rural Nigeria, right? And people who had to go in and like deal with warlords to put, put up towers and any number of things. And now they have just robustly, hugely profitable companies, right? You know, you're looking again too often. It's what is the marginal difference I can make in a market where this exists versus, hey, this thing doesn't exist in these markets. And that is a sign that there's an opportunity as opposed to a lack thereof. So very much along the lines of, what you're talking about. That's not I agree. I agree. It's, it's yep. very, exciting. It's very exciting though. We actually find that very exciting that being able to create new markets, new opportunities, it's going to change a lot of people's lives. And in the end, if you're not, it's not if that's not part of your company's mission, you're really missing out. We believe if, if you're in FinTech because there's just a huge opportunity to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, 
you know, financial systems are a key component to the freedoms and uh, success of a nation. So the more you can empower those countries to basically support their own populace with effective technology, uh, financial and access to financial services, yeah, you're definitely doing a service uh, to those to those people. So yeah, you're not you're not exactly a socially driven company, but I must say that uh, the social angle of this is one that is uniquely fascinating. So perfect. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, this is you know. I, you know, maybe back in infrastructure isn't the funniest uh, topic for most people, but to me, this is, I, I tell you, the most, one of the most exciting developments happening in the marketplace today. And I wish you nothing but luck because the success of platforms like yours will create a very much more interesting and hopefully client consumer friendly experience altogether. Thank you so much. It was great chatting with you. So that was my interview with Michael of Hydrogen Platform. I hope you found that informative. And frankly, companies like him, they're going to really lay the groundwork for some incredible innovative changes in finance. Hope you enjoyed that. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever you get your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at jasonperera.com.